This is the 966, the podcast that focuses on all things Saudi Arabia from the two guys who produce the most widely read daily email newsletter on the kingdom. This week, we'll be talking about tapping into the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, Saudi Arabia's enviable COVID-19 response, and sports washing. But as always, before we get to it this week, Richard, a special shukran to all those who have smashed that subscribe button on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, shukran. especially for those of you who have given us a review. We also love hearing from you guys. We've gotten a lot of people reaching out to us. You can get in touch with us at the 966podcast at gmail.com or send us a tweet at 966podcast. Negative feedback always goes directly to Richard. Don't spoil my Thanksgiving. Um, also, just want to know before we get started really quickly, um, occasionally we might misspeak or say something that is just factually incorrect. Um, we strive for perfection here, um, but check out the comment section of our episodes or videos. Um, we may post a correction down in the comment section just so that we can, um, you know, get the record straight. Uh, let's get started with it, though, today, Richard. What's your one big thing for this week? My one big thing, uh, two big announcements last week in the world of Saudi Arabian football. Uh, first, the Saudi Arabian Football Federation launched the first season of the Saudi Women's Football League with an opening, the opening game this past Monday, November 22nd. The league will feature 16 different teams, six from Riyadh and Jeddah and four from Dammam. And games will be held uh, in Riyadh, Jeddah and Dammam. The league will have two phases with the top three finishers in Riyadh and Jeddah and the first and second uh, finishers in Dammam qualifying for the Kingdom Final Championship to be held early next year in Jeddah at the King Abdullah Sports City Stadium, which is really nice. Uh, also announced officially this past week was the appointment of Monica Staub as the first Saudi women's national football team coach. Uh, although this was just announced and made official, she's been sort of on the job uh, for several months and has visited 28 women's football clubs in Riyadh, Jeddah, and Dammam, each with between 20 and 40 players. Uh, trials held for the national team uh, drew 700 hopefuls, and Coach Staub has chosen 25 out of the 30 players who will comprise the national team and they are already training. The final selection, though, depends on the performances of individual players in this season's Saudi Women's Football League. Uh, coach Staub, who started coaching after a professional playing career in Germany spanning more than two decades and a coaching career in which she has worked with female footballers in more than 80 countries, uh, from North Korea to Iran and Algeria uh, to Ga Gambia, observed that it was not until 1970 that the German Football Association allowed women to play. I have been struggling for over 50 years, even in Germany, the, the former midfielder says. Girls were not allowed to play when I started when I was 11 years old. We had to fight for uh, our rights and admission to championships and to play in a league and all that. So it's a little bit of deja vu where I feel that I can contribute because of my experience to help and support them and to build women's football here in Saudi Arabia in a professional structured way. Don't forget, she said. Four years ago, the girls were not allowed to do any sports at high school. I mean, what's happening here? We're having some kind of revolution. Uh, so that was a big week in, uh, in women's football in Saudi Arabia. You know, we, um, we had an interview, a feature interview with Lena Albaina uh, earlier, which was just excellent. And she's heavily involved with uh, sports across the kingdom, but especially basketball, although the Jeddah United Sports Club also has, has soccer. But... They, this is their second, the, the, the basketball league, women's basketball league, this is their second season. Uh, so these things are progressing. And so this was very exciting. And I wanted to add one thing. Um, since 2017, women's sports in Saudi Arabia has witnessed a 149% increase with more than 195,000 girls between the ages of 5 and 15 now exercising weekly. Uh, and I wanted to draw a little parallel. I looked at the Billie Jean King Foundation. And you remember Title IX, which was part of the U.S. Equal Rights Amendment, which was signed again in 1972. And we keep, it's like Monica Staub, you know, women not be able to play until 1970. And, and Equal Rights Amendment, Title IX, which allowed women's sports to be on an equal footing with men's sports, 1972 in the U.S. Since Title IX's passage, female participation at high school level has grown by 1,057% and by 614% at the college level. Uh, only to say that these, uh, 
changes are afoot in Saudi Arabia. And, it, you know, if it's any parallel with the U.S., and you, we know there's tremendous excitement in Saudi Arabia on the part of women to participate in sports, it, that we'll continue to see this positive trajectory in terms of participation. Yeah, it's cool. It's sort of like it has to start somewhere. Things like this have to begin. They have to have a starting point. And, you know, if you look at soccer in the U.S. right now, and this is not, you know, terribly related, but I mean, if you look at soccer in the U.S. right now, uh, the women's national team is just as popular, it seems, as the men's national team, in part because Saudi Arabia is, um, excuse me, in part because the, the U.S. doesn't have a huge interest in soccer in the same way that it does sport, uh, football and basketball and many other sports. But, you know, this is huge. I mean, this is like a historic week. I mean, they're really just getting this started and it won't be next week or next month where we start seeing a very active sports league or a, you know, really strong Saudi national women's team compete. But you start now just like Germany did in 1970 and the U.S. did around that time as well. Like that these things take time to build. It's really cool that they're starting now. I mean, with all the changes going on, of course. So yeah, really yeah. interesting. It is. And speaking of hurdles, I mean, one of the interesting things about US, uh, that uh, U.S. women's national team is they now are paid equally mm -hmm. with the U.S. men's national team, which is, you know, an achievement they just uh, it just occurred recently. So uh, that's, you know, there's always, there's always a, an obstacle to overcome. But like you say, it's it gets started and Saudi Arabia in terms of women's participation since since 2016, 2017 has begun. And we're seeing this now in actual leagues, which is just just exciting. Really exciting. You can check out that interview, and we would both highly recommend um, doing that if you haven't yet with Lena Almayina. She is yeah. phenomenal, and uh, Lena was instrumental in getting sports to be developed for women back in 2005 with the founding of Jetta United, like you just mentioned. Um, really, just an awesome insight into the work she did and how. Vision 2030 played into it. And, and it's just, it's really great. So check that out. Um, you can do that at our podcast website, 966.transistor.fm. It's also on um, our main website, sustg.com. Um, but that's, this is really fascinating, uh, really fascinating development and huge for Saudi women. Um, my one you? big thing. You're, you're, you're one BT as we. My one big we... thing um, also involves women. Um, Soundstorm. Uh, not Sandstorm, Soundstorm. Uh, Soundstorm <laughs> is a music festival that is taking place in Saudi Arabia. It is being billed as the region's biggest and loudest music festival, which is always good when your music festival is the loudest. Um, it will take place in Riyadh from December 16th, uh, 16th to 19th and will feature a world-class international music lineup, including more than 150 global superstar headliners and international dance acts, um, including artists, famous artists like Armin van Buren, David Guetta, Dead Mouse, DJ Snake, Eric Pride, Steve Aoki. I mean, this would be a huge festival if it were in the U.S. Um, really cool. Um, the organizing company, MDL Beast, this week added 88 artists to the initial lineup. Um, and it, that includes six female DJs, uh, acts including Blondish, Eli and Fur. I'm, I hope I'm saying all these right. Blondish, Eli and Fur, and the very easy to look at, Emily Lenz and Charlotte DeWitt will all perform. I wanted to mention this um, and also uh, just direct our listeners and viewers to an article that appeared in a local English daily Arab news, which we included in today's um, daily newsletter, which you can get at sustg.com slash the review uh, called Why Are Radical Islamists Attacking Riyadh Season? Just an interesting local perspective on how um, Riyadh season, which is sort of part of, I guess, sort of a maybe sort of a catch all for all of these things going on. Um, uh, just sort of like it, it really just discussed with the local perspective how, um, you know, Islamists are really, really not happy about all of these changes going on. And it was a really cool uh, sort of a, a look at how um, in the press and the English language press, uh, you know, journalists are sort of pushing back on that, saying this is actually really, really good for families. And this is a wonderful event. Um, I know it seems crazy that we're doing all of these things in Saudi Arabia just a few years after we started to open up. But um, anyway, Soundstorm seems awesome. Um, we uh, regrettably won't be making it this year. But um, <laughs> if you are listening or watching this and you want to send us any mu any videos or photos that you take from this festival, it looks awesome. And, you know, of course, it has to be said, it's amazing that a uh, EDM 
music festival will be taking place in Saudi Arabia in the first wow. place, which is unheard of if you were to talk about it five years ago. So really interesting. Um, it, please. Uh, uh, yes, uh, interesting. And be, it's, if, if v listeners and eventual viewers on YouTube get a chance, look at some of the video from the, the Beast event uh, two years ago, 2019, and the Pitbull concert at the beginning of the Riyadh season. I mean, this huge, huge crowds, um, really into it. Uh, you know, just a really exciting electric environment, which is just completely incongruous with the, you know a perception of Saudi Arabia. Um, I'm glad, by the way, that you tried to pronounce all those uh, DJ names because I would have, I would have botched them horribly. We're gonna have to go back. I'm sure we'll hear from some listeners about how I completely botched it um yeah but you miss you miss don diablo cashmere and tachami i missed those on purpose <laughs> no, i'm just kidding <laughs> so, i'm not i'm not i'm sure i'm sure that's not how you pronounce it but you know this is a regular theme and this is it, it, when you mentioned the islamists who aren't happy with the Riyadh season and a lot of the things that are opening and the and the social relaxation uh in terms of entertainment and and convening and restaurants and everything uh so you know the formula one that's upcoming in 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 riyadh and jeddah they had to send out a directive as you remember on on uh what to wear so as you said no bikinis uh you know the eternals which is you know a, a major you know major the most recent in the a marvel comic universe r release uh, isn't being aired in Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Egypt um, and it, because of certain, uh, because of in terms of how it reflects a certain relationship and, and other things. So the point being is Saudi Arabia is making great strides, but there's a constant dynamic where they have to address a conservative culture and specific segments of that culture. And they they can't, even though, from the outside, we go, well, why are you even listening to this? Why do you care? Was, but, but they can't just ignore this because this is a big part of the society, this traditional society. So the point is this is I, I think it's important to have some patience with this evolution and this progress. You can't just snap your fingers. You have to deal with, with constituencies that are very important to society overall and just are struggling with this change. So, and that will come. Uh, but it's just funny how this this crops up and it's important to take notice of it that Saudi Arabia is trying to move forward but it's trying to do it in a responsible authentic way um, and it's making progress but that doesn't mean it's a direct line yeah it's good to see miss uh it's good to see Pitbull live up to his nickname Mr. Worldwide by playing at uh at Riyadh season that was a really cool video Speaking, um and, and, and aside you know Sarah my my 19 year old is a sophomore at Clemson and one of their they had a big uh they had a semi-formal whatever an event and everybody went women all the women went dressed up as pitbull and it got on instagram and pitbull followed up on it and, and was was uh you know was complimenting them on their effort so anyway pitbull's pitbull's big around our house that's <laughs> that's that is awesome we're gonna have to we're gonna have to see that that photo no. did they what did they do about the bald head they all Was had the thing? stocking caps and the glasses and the mustaches and the every you know they had the facial you know so th th these are these are you know young women in college you know they went all out and did it right so when you of have, course when you put 12 of them together or whatever however many 16 you know, it's quite impressive, all these, you know, female pit bull impersonators, which I guess which prompted his response. <laughs> that's uh, that's really cool. I got to I got to see that photo. That's awesome. <laughs> Let's move on to topic one, uh, tapping the strategic petroleum reserve. This will also be a topic around many Thanksgiving dinner tables tomorrow. <laughs> President Biden will release 50 million barrels of oil from the SPR, of which 32 million will be an exchange of oil that will re be returned in the years ahead and 18 million will be the acceleration of a sale of oil previously authorized by Congress. Um, this is done, Richard, this is a very complex and very deep topic. I'm very excited about it. Um, this is done really in response to pump prices in the US, which are up 61% from a year ago. They're not astronomically high right now. It's really the rate at which they rose that is causing some alarm and causing some political stress for President Biden. Um, 
The SPR itself is its own issue that's really cool to talk about. It's a complex of four sites with deep underground storage caverns created in salt domes, and those are located along the Texas and Louisiana Gulf Coasts. Um, right now, the SPR has 604 million barrels of oil, a balance of both sweet and sour crude. And the SPR's existence, original existence, is unfortunately tied to Saudi Arabia. The SPR was set up 40 years ago in response to the Arab oil crisis of 1973. Um, but it doesn't really, Richard, appear like this is going to make a huge impact on oil prices. It's sort of a political decision. Let's talk about the SPR and, and oil prices. I think you laid that out nicely. And and I would only add that one of the, the notable things about this was it was done sort of collaboratively with China, India, Japan, South Korea, and the UK. And the estimate is that there'll be 100 million barrels put into the system. Uh, and it's especially significant because China and India aren't part of the uh, International Energy Agency. Um, so this is a coordinated release. Like you say, 100 million barrels overall, 50 million from the US. Uh, estimates estimate that it could reduce the price of Brent uh, maybe six dollars, which would effectively translate into a gasoline savings of about ten cents a gallon nice. sometime in December, January. Um, so, I have a particular perspective on this. I think you know. I think the and you nailed it. So the gas pri gas prices there. The gas prices were two dollars per gallon in April 2020. Obviously, this is the, the pandemic hit in March. Uh, it's as you say, it's up. Uh, but everything I think you need to know, let me let me read this quote uh, uh, about the circumstances. So just 43 percent of voters approve of Biden's job performance, according to an analysis of polls by 538. And the Washington Post ABC News poll published earlier this month found that 70 percent of Americans regard the economy negative, negative, negatively, despite substantial growth in employment and economic output under Biden. The U.S. Consumer Price Index, as inflation, has increased 6.2% re last month from October 2020, the fastest annual pace since 1990, so 31 years, which is what you alluded to. While economists believe rising inflation is due to unprecedented consumer demand following the pandemic shutdowns, Republicans have blamed Biden and his economic policies. So, in my opinion, I think this is a political move. Um, I would add that the issues with gas prices, right, and a lot of that has to do with um, uh, refiners, U.S. refiners, taking production offline. So uh, again, back to April 2020, sudden drop in consumption, lockdowns, uh, remote work, uh, as we said, $2 per gallon. Uh, and oil refiners cut their production by nearly 40 percent. They went from a peak of 1.8 million barrels per day pre-pandemic to 1.1 million barrels per day in, in May 2020. Some of those refiners shut down plants. So basically, overall refining capacity shrunk by 4.5 percent. So while they're offline or they're you know throttling back production, gas demand has gotten back to pre-pandemic levels and has you know, has been chugging along pretty well. And so the glut is now gone. It's now gas inventory is down 6% lower than pre-pandemic levels. So the U.S. industry and the U.S. gas industry needs about six months, maybe a little bit more, to get to ramp up to previous levels of production. So the EIA who has already said, look, the, the gas prices will peak in November. And they will fall steadily for the following year. And 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 any long-term dip in prices will likely be driven by an increase in refinery production rather than one-off sales from national reserves or slow-moving regulatory investigations. So one-off, one-off sales from the SPR. That's what the EIA says. So, you know, the market was working itself out. Mm -hmm. um, I think. Uh, President Biden is in a tough spot because inflation in particular is really hard on lower income or fixed on income. So it's very hard to stand by. On top of that, he's getting really pinged for for the economy and for inflation in particular. And gas prices is particularly uh, prominent in terms of consumers' minds, a prominent 
part of you know inflationary costs because everything else is up too. So I, I think it's um, I think he needed to do something. I think the markets had already priced that he would do something into it. Uh, so that's why the oil prices didn't change much. I think he sort of, uh, it's a little bit of a misdirection, because uh, as we talked about last time, too, in terms of oil production, U.S. oil production is picking up. The Permian had its highest uh, record last month, highest record output uh, ever. Um, so 4.953 million barrels per day in, you know, is expected actually in December, my apologies. So, so you know, oil production is picking up. Uh, you know, this was going to work itself out. Uh, just mm -hmm. politically, we didn't, uh, the, the you know, president didn't have time to wait on it. What I worry about and what I don't like to see is a sort of, um, you know, OPEC plus versus IEA plus. Um, uh, you know, this sort of constructing a drama here. Now, what is OPEC plus going to do? You know, they have, uh, they're, they're, you know, talking. You know, they have in place a slow ramp up. Their forecasts are, are 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 worrisome to them in the sense that they, you know, they see you know COVID restrictions re, re returning in Europe. Um, they don't want to get too far ahead of it and oversupply the market. You know, now the question is, you know, is is the is it on now between Saudi Arabia and the U.S.? I think it's just a silly. I just think it's unfortunate. I also think that the, the SPR, this draw, will not make, as you, you, you heard the numbers, 10 cents a gallon, you know, starting in mid to late December. It's not going to make a big difference. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, too. I mean, it's you mentioned the word political. I mean, this is a political tool. Um, I mean, it's an economic tool if it were used in the way that it were designed to be used, um, which is to, you know, prevent an energy shortage or prevent, you know, another Arab oil embargo where you have gas lines around the corner, not really to save Americans a few bucks. So it's sort of like, it's sort of like he, President Biden made this decision knowing that it wasn't going to be a huge impact. Um, he would get some criticism. The market had already sort of priced this possibility out anyway, but doing nothing makes President Biden, Biden look like he is powerless. And he, in a way, is powerless, but um, it's sort of a symbolic thing. I mean, at least it seems like to me, um, you know, the, but, but the SPR was created for emergencies. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see it being used in this way. And it, it has been used um, in this way in the past. Um, well, as you actually, mentioned, oh, please go ahead. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I mean, as I understand, it's basically been used. It's, uh, it, it was used when a uh, significant percentage of Libyan production went offline and it was used during Katrina. Yeah. I mean, I think this is the first time it's been used this way. Yeah. And I mean, you know, oil prices are, are high. They're not at their highest. Right. Um, and like, like we were talking about earlier, it's really the, the rate in which they increased from last year. Um, but um, a very, a very interesting uh, decision that he took. Um, I do want to mention the SPR is actually a really cool engineering um, <laughs> uh, construction. It's, it's four sites and they're storing these uh, between 6 million and 37 million barrels of oil in uh, salt caverns, which are along the coast. And the reason why they use these salt caverns is because they connect to, um, all the different, uh, pipelines and, um, maritime ter terminals for crude oil distribution. So they're, they're strategically placed and all of the oil is sort of underground where it's safe from attack. It's also cheap to, to store oil in these salt caverns. They repair themselves easily, um, just because of the type of stone that is, uh, surrounding the cavern really really cool stuff it was really fun to to look into this um and uh but but right now it's it's sort of like this announcement came and oil basically stayed at where it was going to be staying at for a while and yeah. so um you know right before thanksgiving it's interesting because now there's this okay when you're around the table well he's working on it he wants to get these prices down he did this it's a it's just sort of it's a very interesting situation. It's not like reaching into a bank account that you have and putting money right on the table saying this is ready to go. This oil will take its, some time to work its way into the system. And so it's and it's obviously not right. all the SPR. So um, it, a very, very interesting topic. And I would I it is interesting. And I would add that uh, and you noted that that, you know, 32 
so 50 million barrels, 32 is going to have to come back in. So mm -hmm. they're going to have to go back and repurchase this 32 somewhere down the line. 18 million barrels is regular uh, part of a regular drawdown that's scheduled. You know, it was, it was going to be released in the coming months because they have regular drawdowns um, mandated. And the other thing is, is, is as I understand it, so the predominant type uh, of crude is going to be sour, which so so high uh, high sulfate content. And and that's not really preferred type in terms of refiners. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, uh, again, it, it, it is. I think it's it's politics and it's uh, necessary, I guess, from President Biden's and and it makes it a little thing. I hope the Saudis. I hope OPEC Plus doesn't overreact. I think there are people in uh, you know there are countries within that 23 member group. Obviously, Saudi Arabia and then Russia outside of it is, is the most important player. But UAE doesn't want to. They don't want to cut back on on increased production. There's a number of others that want to keep going. So I assume those those voices will prevail and they'll just have a meeting next in early December and it will be normal. Let's not get contentious or confrontational about all this. You know, Richard, what a difference 18 months makes. Um, yeah. You know, with the Russian-Saudi oil spat right at the beginning of the pandemic, oil tanked. Um, you know, looking ahead 18 months from that, we're in this position. It's kind of amazing that Saudi Arabia had the patience it had to say, "Okay, everybody, calm down. We're going to work on this. We're going to we're going to we're going to get everybody together. Russia, Saudi Arabia, all of OPEC plus. Um, it's going to take a while to get the price back up, but they did it. Um, and it's and now we're in the situation where they're getting heat from, you know, the U.S. government saying, hey, uh, the prices are getting a little too high. Would you mind, you know, scaling them back a little bit? And it's it's just interesting. And 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 as we know, President Trump job owned the OPEC plus into. Uh, you know, prices were too low, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, cut back production and because, you know, prices are too low. I mean, so you got one, you know. You've got uh, a message from one and a message from another. The other thing about the difficulty with President Biden is, you know, he, he, he's he's uh, a proponent of, of climate change initiatives, and and we've just finished COP26, and he I think he was very committed to these these goals. So it's a difficult position to be uh, promoting that perspective and then saying, okay, we need we need to uh, increase fossil fuel production. Yeah, but, and we've talked about that a lot on our podcast, which is just a really interesting sort of head to head, you know, the, yeah. the are we going to be pumping more oil and, and having cheap oil now? Or are we going to start moving to clean energy? And, and can we? And can we? Yeah. So yeah. Um, very interesting. Um, let's move on to topic two. We could go on that forever, but let's go on to topic two, <laughs> um, Saudi Arabia's COVID-19 response. Um, Richard, this is a topic that we've inevitably talked about every week since launching the 966 indirectly. Mm -hmm. um, the coronavirus touched every corner of the global economy and beating it is key to any lasting recovery for both individual economies and the global economy as a whole. Um, Saudi Arabia, uh, their COVID-19 response is the envy, frankly, the envy of the world. They seized the moment when COVID-19 hit to take progressive, and I use that word progressive, measures to counteract the coronavirus from curfews and safety preventions to effectively mandating a vaccine for all. That, um, and, and look at where Saudi Arabia is right now. They've had fewer than 100 new daily cases of COVID since mid-September. That sounds really nice. Um, it's, it's sort of like the kingdom tackled COVID with the benefit of hindsight. Um, just very interesting from swift lockdowns to prevention measures. They've canceled the Hajj and scaled it back a second time. I mean, these were expensive things to do in the time. Um, but as of today, 70% of Saudi Arabia has had at least one vaccine and uh, the economy is roaring back to life right now. Envy is a good word, especially sitting here as an American. Uh, envy is a good word. And it's really interesting you use the term hindsight. And so, uh, but let me, before I get to that, first, first of all, Saudi Arabia has a, a, a legitimate reason to be really proud. Second of all, um, the regime has a little a legitimate reason to be very pleased because this 
was a critical, critical test of good governance. Uh, one in which uh, any number of government, uh, governments and regimes failed across the globe, including ours initially. Um, and we continue to have problems, but that's, that's in less governance than just the social uh, politiz politicization of it. Um, but they passed this test with flying colors. And so hindsight, you mentioned hindsight. They were really well prepared for this test, and, and so we have to remember that, that uh, in an average year, to take out the pandemic in, in 2020, but it, it typically Saudi Arabia has over 10 million pilgrims from 184 countries come to Mecca for the Hajj or Umrah every year. So we're talking 2 to 2.5 million, a very concentrated period during Hajj, and another uh, 6 to 8 million over the course of the year doing Umrah. And, and so they're dealing with public health, infectious disease issues. And, and you, when you go back, again, hindsight, in 1996, you had the Asian H, H5N1 bird flu uh, epidemic. 2002, SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome. 2012, MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. 2020, COVID-19. Uh, Saudi Arabia has been practicing and they've become really adept at dealing with this and i want to read a, a couple of things here the saudi government's success in alert and response planning for infectious diseases is, is attributable to a multidisciplinary group of experts from various government sectors who are involved in advanced planning of health services logistical support and communications for the Hajj. continuous monitoring of emerging infectious diseases ensures that uh, for example, infection with the MERS uh, in an individual is not trans transmitted to other programs. Uh, the Saudi government coordinates the Hajj activities through a Supreme Committee and 24 sub subcommittees for the Hajj. Uh, uh, based on th uh, three key planning considerations by Saudi government for communicable diseases, alert and response are all based on whose recommendations for communicable World Health Organization's recommendations for communicable, communicable disease alert and response during mass gatherings. Uh, during the height of the pandemic in 2020, Saudi Arabia allocated an extra $12.5 billion to the healthcare center. This is healthcare sector. This is in addition to the $45 billion that was already budgeted. Uh, these sums helped expand the provision of additional beds for critical COVID-19 cases and including the designation of 80,000 beds across 25 hospitals, which included 8,000 intensive care units and 2,200 isolation beds. Um, separately, the funds helped facilitate the rollout of, of a free countrywide mass rapid testing program. Uh, so Saudi Arabia, based on you know its experience of having these uh, eight to 10 million pilgrims every year, based on these previous uh, epidemics, responded appropriately, and they responded uh, according to science. And it's, as I said, I'm envious. Uh, they were decisive, and they were persistent, and they didn't, they didn't relent too early. Uh, and, you know, they started early, and they didn't quit early, you know. So they have a, they have a lot to be proud of. I should also add, you know, one of the things that was part of this was this, uh, the, the Talwal Kalna application, which is, you know, on phones, was introduced to track the spread of COVID-19. It, you know, it, it, it would allow you to get into some place, you know, school or a restaurant or wherever. It has 20 million follow users. And now it's being adapted to, do, you know, include your passport data. So this is, you know, a digital technology that was applied in, in response to a public health crisis. Again, part and parcel to what was an intelligent, full-bore, science-based response. And, and boy, that would be nice. That would be nice. What's interesting to me that it, since, since the coronavirus started, I've always sort of thought of Saudi Arabia as being well-positioned to deal with the coronavirus because of its the way that its government is structured. I mean, one of the reasons why we had such terrible problems in the US and why they're still ongoing is because we have 50 governors, we have all of these, and then local ordinances, counties, all of these different systems of governments working together. The great democratic experiment is just so poorly equipped to handle a pandemic where you really need 
basically a strong hand to say, this is what we're going to be doing. Everybody get on board <laughs> with whatever program we're going to do. We are locking things down. We're shutting down flights. This is, there's no debate here. This is just what we're going to do. And it's, I know it's, I'm not like saying that I'm envious of their system of government necessarily, but at the same time, like, you know, when decisions need to be made and they need to be made swiftly and decisively, like, you know, you can make them in Saudi Arabia. I mean, they, they shut down the airports, they stopped, you know, international flights, they canceled a huge event. I mean, it, at the Hajj, um, it's just interesting because twice. it's like, they, they, they have that twice. Yeah. They have the sort of government structure that's built for fast decisions and, and, you know, they have enormously popular leadership um, where people are, are going to follow the line and, and look where they are today. I mean, it's just amazing. A fewer than 100 new daily cases of COVID. I think the United States had 70,000 yesterday and that's and we're sort of on the decline. It's amazing. Of all 259 million cases worldwide, Saudi Arabia has had only 55,000 of those. So just ama I mean, it's it just it's amazing. And and um, and now that with with oil prices high, they're opening things back up. Riyadh season. I mean, things are back in Saudi Arabia. You know, it's funny that you should mention that. So I have in my notes here, I have keys to success. <laughs> One, authoritarian government. <laughs> Two, financial means. Three, follow the science. Four, be decisive. You, you know, it, it, in, if you really wanted to be cynical about this, it would have been Saudi Arabia. It, it, you could really criticize Saudi Arabia if it had whiffed on this. I say that because, it, it, as you say, the system was in place, the means were in place, the experience was in place, the proclivity to follow the science was in place. So it was really set up for Saudi Arabia to succeed. But that didn't just, it didn't occur. It came, that was earned, earned uh, expertise, earned experience. Uh, and they took what they have, their assets, in terms of this crisis, which is a centralized authoritarian government and the financial means to do what needed to be done. And they implemented it. And they should be very pleased, uh, and they're they're reaping the benefits, like you say. The economy's bounced back, and and things are going nicely now. I think the Saudis feel very, very good about uh, how they weathered this storm. It was interesting at the height of the pandemic. Um, you had Ramad, like at least once you had Ramadan, um, which is a time where um, followers of Islam gather together in the evenings and. Um, you know, that was, that was a really, it's not like they, Saudi Arabia had an easy time with the coronavirus. I mean, we mentioned that it was expensive, but no. socially it was also very difficult. Saudis are very welcoming, hospitable. Um, you know, they, they like to spend time together. Everybody does, but I mean, you know, just especially during that time. And, and, um, it was just interesting because, um, during Ramadan last year, I'm, I'm sure it had a very weird, strange vibe for Saudis. Um, just you know, getting together and, and, you know, having to be very careful. And that is right around when we saw some big spikes in Saudi Arabia. And then, you know, slowly and surely they've held the line. Like you said, I love that four part thing. I wish we could for the next pandemic, we're going to have to get that playbook in the mix, but, um, yeah, I know. um, just very, just very interesting. And, and so we don't have to go back and do an error statement. Uh, they did cancel the Hajj in 2020. This year, it was uh, reduced considerably, only 60,000, and everybody from, and only people from Saudi Arabia. Those so. photos were really strange to see because yeah. it was the Hajj, as it always is, the same photos that always come out from the SPA. But the, instead of having 2 million people there, there were like, what do you say, 50,000? 60,000. Yeah, yeah, so it, it, it looked like sparse. It was very strange and, and orderly. There were like, you know, space in between pilgrims kind of cool, but also a little strange to see. By the way, yeah, that that reference to authoritarian regimes, and we're, we're going to have to have a conversation about that at some point, about the, the evolving sort of political approach that a lot of countries are having. So I went and looked on the, the Economist's uh, Democracy Index for the year 2020. And they list four types of regimes, full democracies, flawed democracies, hybrid regimes, and authoritarian regimes. And, and I'm gonna, I'll just ask you, uh, what's your guess in terms of full democracies, the full democracies, the percentage of countries in the world that are classified as full democracies? 
so like not just so like not does that include like representative republics or is it just like full on like well, I like, don't have the exact the exact definitions of what they are, but it's what you would imagine as in, in, in when you draw up a, a fully realized democratic state. I would say it's small, a handful. <laughs> You're, yeah. um, but that's, I'm trying to hedge because I don't actually that's, know. <laughs> that's perceptive of you. All right, so let me just full democracies: twenty three countries, thirteen point eight percent of the global population, uh, thirty percent of all countries. Let me do it by world population, actually. So full democracies. Uh, 23 countries, 8.4% of the world population. Flawed democracies, of which the U.S. is listed in this one, 52 countries, 41% of the global population. Hybrid regimes, 35 countries, 15% of world population. Authoritarian regimes, 57 countries, 35.6% of the world population. Um, I only I only say that because I, I you know labeling is uh, problematic in many ways. And you know, autocratic, authoritarian, uh, monarchist, uh, monarchy. You, you know, so, so, and Saudi Arabia doesn't rate very well in this uh, this uh, democracy index, uh, as do a lot of other countries. But it's it's interesting to see this this rundown, and it's interesting. It would be interesting to go back and and see how the full democracy or the flawed democracies did in this COVID epidemic, because we see we saw ours. And it certainly stumbled out of the gate. Uh, we're we're still seeing ours. We are still yeah. battling COVID, and it's not a beautiful thing to watch. It's really <laughs> quite hideous, actually. <laughs> it is in many ways. <laughs> <laughs> um, fascinating. And I uh, just wanted to add one more thing to this discussion. Um, Judwood Investment had a really awesome um, sort of research note that they came out with this with this week and uh we included it on our website and our daily newsletter really interesting stuff not just about the COVID 19 response and all of that stuff that went into it but what um is ahead for healthcare in saudi arabia in the run-up to 2030 it's going to be a huge sector it already is a huge sector um but you know saudi arabia's population is so young but um, as they get older, that brings with it all these different health challenges and opportunities. Um, so um, check that out on our website, sustg.com. Really cool report. And, and you can a, find it it's, got, it's full of graphics and stuff. Just fascinating if you're interested in that sector. Yeah. So, yes, uh, topic three, let's, uh, let's get to it. Sports washing. Um, we've wanted to talk about this for a while. There's just been so much <laughs> going on. Um, but let's talk about it, Richard. Um, if you're not familiar with this term, sports washing is essentially when a country or a corporation uses sports to improve, in, to improve its reputation. Um, usually this is done through host, hosting a sporting event or, you know, the purchase of a team or sponsorship or participation in the sport itself. Um, it's a negative term and it's often directed at Saudi Arabia, but it's been used against China, Russia, and many others. Um, a report out earlier this year said that Saudi Arabia spent $1.5 billion on high profile international sports and sporting events. And that report was published before the purchase of Newcastle United by the public investment fund. So I'm sure it's higher than that. Um, the kingdom also has a $650 million 10 year deal with formula one, which we've talked about on this podcast as well. Um, Richard, let's talk about this. I don't really get it. I don't understand <laughs> what it is. Um, but I'll, uh, let me toss it over to you before I get into my rant. But so examples of sports washing that, that people bring up, the Beijing Olympics in 2008, the 2014 Sochi Winter Olympics in Russia, uh, 1974 Rumble in the Jungle boxing match between Muhammad Ali and George Foreman, hosted by then Zaire, a dictator, Mobito Sissiko, uh, the Nazi Olympics. The original. Yeah, yeah, the original sports watch. In 1934, World Cup, which was held in Italy during the rule of the Mussolini. So... Yes. Um, let me also, this is, a, this is a comment, and I'll read this, bear with me, but this is Damien Phillips commenting, the EU observer. No European journalist who has eyes in their head has been hoodwinked into believing either Saudi Arabia or the UAE, UAE don't have major issues that they must address simply because they're a prominent sporting patron. By owning clubs in European nations, both nations have brought these issues to the fore and made them tangible to a much broader audience, broader audience than if they had remained as faraway countries with little impact for the average European citizen. 
This capacity for sports washing to backfire has been seen time and time again. And he references Sochi and, and, uh, and, and, and then he closes. No doubt the moral panic over sports washing will arise again in the lead up to the next year's Winter Olympics in Beijing as China seeks to re rehabilitate its sullied stature in the wake of cover up the coronavirus and uh, ethnic cleansing of the Uyghur Muslims. So you see there sort of the gist of what sports want, you know, what the – and, and this Damien Phillips is referring to something that's called the Streisand effect, by the way. Did you know there was a Streisand effect? I did effect? not. So you learn Streisand. something every podcast you do. <laughs> <laughs> the Streisand effect – is a phenomenon that occurs when an attempt to hide, remove, or censor information, or misdirect it, has the unintended consequence of increasing awareness of that information, often via the internet. It is named after the American singer Barbara Streisand, whose attempt to suppress the California Coastal Records Project photograph of her residence in Malibu, California, taken to document co California coastal erosion, inadvertently drew greater attention to it. So this is the Streisand effect. So the argument is, and I think, Let's look at, and I want to get into some other stuff, which is probably more interesting. I have to chuckle a little bit that the Saudis would be concerned about an increased amount of criticism. <laughs> and and I, I really do believe, you know, that they're looking at this and going, well, I don't give a fat flying about this because we get so much anyway. I mean, there's nowhere we're going to hide. And, and you know, it, so we're going to go about this and we're, we're not going to worry about these things. And I think we have to we have to look at how active they've been. And so I, I want to go through a list, but I want to do it. I want to do it in a, in, a, in, a, in a framework, if you'll bear with me, because I need your input on this. Cool. So we're going to put this into into three categories in terms of Saudi investments or you know a global involvement in a in a prominent entity so the first first sort of category is sports washing yes or no investment yes or no and the third one vision 2030 which is specifically uh, is it uh, authentically related or organically involved with vision 2030 goals in terms of participation tourism and the like all right. So let's go over some of that 1.5 trillion. So let's start with that $650 million 10 year deal with Formula One. All right. Is it sports washing? Um, I, I, <laughs> I still don't really, I'm sorry that I'm not, I, I'm sorry. Cause I still don't really understand. Like, are they not allowed to have any <laughs> sports at all? Like developing a quality of life is like one of the three pillars in the, in the vision 2030. Yeah. it's like, well, and actually they're very much into automotive. So, all right. So, so I, right, let's look at it. So, so if you're looking as an investment, so there are 20 Grand Prix events every year in 20 different countries. Formula One is one of the most global and most popular sports, and it has an annual TV audience of over 500 million. By the way, it has really picked up interest in the U.S. because of Netflix's uh, docu-series, Formula One Drive to Survive. Have you seen any of that? No, it looks really cool. It looks really cool. I haven't either. I, I'll have to check it out. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to assess this in a, in a reasonable way. I mean, and, and first, I think what we both agree is if it's sports washing, it's sports washing. Mm -hmm. Something a lot of countries do, and in, in Saudi Arabia, you can has legitimate criticisms about uh, human rights issues. Um, but it, it also has uh, intrinsic merit from Saudi Arabia's perspective for a number of other reasons. So that that Formula One uh, thing, and by the way, before I get off of that six hundred fifty million dollar Formula One, um, the Saudi Minister of, of Sport and the President of the, the Olympic Committee. Prince Abdulaziz has been Turkey off Faisal has some interesting observations about the motorsport, and he said that it's it's good to remember that that Formula E race that they did in Daria. Remember they did that. The Formula E is electric Formula One cars. It's pretty awesome. Uh, they ran a race in 2018. It spurred the creation of their tourist visa. So a tourist visa that was acceptable all over the world wasn't in Saudi in 2017. They put it together in about three months. Mm -hmm. 
in order for people to attend that, and of course now you can get a tourist visa and it's 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 common operating procedure. Um, so so you know ping ping this for all you want, and you know they they have the next early next month they have the 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 Saudi uh, F one, uh, and there's a discussion the 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 guy who just won the Qatar and is one of the leading F1 drivers has an LGBTQ helmet you know uh support of things you know are you going to be able to wear that yeah of course you're going to be able to wear that and he, you know they've talked about it they know it, fine wear that um so anyway so you have that 650 million dollar 10 year deal with formula 1 the next in terms of size is a 500 million 10 year deal with world wrestling wrestling entertainment now, and that was started in 2014. <laughs> well, and, you know, you may not think WWE is a sport. I happen to think that the WWE uh, entertainers are, some of them are terrific athletes. I mean, some of the stuff they do is in, insanely difficult. Well, but that's a 500 million. That is, that to me is a pure entertainment play for Saudi youth. Would you agree? Totally. Um, I guess you can call it sports washing, but I mean that's that's organic. That was really in response to demand, because the, the, there's tremendous interest in Saudi Arabia and WWE. Um, so let's bring it to Saudi. So I mean that that was that was a, a, I think a good uh, organic play. Uh, Newcastle United, four hundred and ten million. Sports washing, investment. Vision 2030? All of the above, although I still, again, I, I'm not, I, I, I've just, and, and if I just may, I think that like to, to me, like to, to, to like have sports washing, you have to like try, there has to be like an effort. You have to be like, we have a problem. We need to cover it up. And we think this is a way to do it. So, so I'm going to say sports washing, but I still don't think there was some, you know, nefarious bad plan behind that, I think they see it as possibly a good investment and also as, you know, a source of, of pride. I mean, it's, it's cool. I mean, it, you know, how many Saudis are now going to be fans of, of Newcastle United? So I'm sorry, to, cause I, I do like this nope. formula here. I'm just, I'm still confused by the thing, but let, let's, go I would say, so, so I would say you pass that with flying colors. I think it's all three. So let me go, let's look at, let's look at that. So let's say it's sports washing and let's say this is, they're, they're, they're following well-trod you know, path, you know, uh, Roman Abramowitz bought, you know, Russian at, at the behest, apparently, of Putin bought a team in 2003. The, the Emiratis bought a team in 12, 2012. The Qataris brought uh, Paris Saint-Germain. Um, so, you know, lots of folks are, are buying into these premier leagues. Um, but let's look, let's look at that Newcastle United on two, two fronts. Uh, and... All right, so let's say it's sports washing. Let's say it's intrinsic to to Vision 2030. And let's go back to um, the Olympic Committee chair and the sports chair, and Billy's been Turkey Al Faisal, and take a quote. He said, football contributes to all key pillars of our holistic strategy as a ministry. It's a game that represents a source of great passion for Saudi in general, as it promotes diversity and inclusion in our society and supports participation, youth development, and sports, sports economy. We want to aim to be genuine contenders on a global stage to truly reflect the undeniable talent of our youth along with the country's love for the game. So uh, our comprehensive and ambitious plan will propel Saudi Arabia to become among the elite football nations through an extensive investment in player development and targeted solutions uh, you know, across the pathway. So he's saying just what you said, you know, Saudi is very passionate about football. They you know, they, their national team, which uh, they now is, is actually doing very well, is currently ranked 46th by FIFA. Uh, they were ranked as low as 102 in 2015, and they aim to be in the top 20. They have, they have real aggressive and, and, and ambitious goals for their sporting life. Uh, and we'll come back to a separate one. Look, look at investment. All right, so... Deloitte did an interesting study on that Premier League. And what it found was that uh, 
the Champions League. The, uh, so Deloitte's research finds that teams finishing the top four league positions the previous season, qualifying them for the UEFA Champions League, generated average revenues of 444 million pounds in the last financial year, compared with an average of just 141 million for teams not competing in European com competition. So this would be Newcastle United, which is in down. But every team that's been got you know the the the, the Manchester City. Uh, team, the uh, 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 the Bromwich team, I'm not sure. I think it's Chelsea, right? Chelsea. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they've all gotten in the first division. They're all making money, a lot of money. And in general, Newcastle United is in a pretty good situation. It made, you know, it, it, it's its total cash is at about 62 million pounds. So it, it's not in bad shape. But if they run it well, it can be a revenue generator. And as we all know, when you own a franchise like this, and no money is not so much in yearly profits, it's what you end up selling it for. Mm -hmm. So you could argue it's a good investment. Um, so, all right, so that's the Newcastle United. All right, 200 million Asian golf tour. And by the way, and, and so let's wrap that in also with uh, the 5 million that Saudi has plowed into the Saudi International Golf Tournament and the Ladies European Tour in particular. Aramco has been involved with that. So golf is uh, golf is something they're really trying to grow in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so, you know, sports washing, but yeah, but it also could be a very good investment, and it's certainly consistent with what they're trying to do at home with golf. 145 million three-year deal with the Spanish Football Association to host the Spanish Super Cup. Let's let's roll that in with what we were talking about in, in terms of the environment, in terms of set excitement for Saudi Arabia. And by the way, that's now been extended to 2029. So the possible total amount is you know over 300 million. All these you, you can make really good sense. All right, so 100 million for the Ruiz Joshua fight in 2019. Sheer sports washing. Um, but also that was extremely entertainment, entertaining for fight fans in Saudi Arabia. $60 million for the Saudi Cup, horse racing. That's extremely authentic in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, trying to build that equestrian uh, uh, sector in, in terms of home. Uh, again, automotive, Dakar Rally, which I love. They have a five-year deal with the Dakar Rally, which is, you know, just roll that into automotive, which they, they seem to like. Uh, Formula E, we mentioned, Daria. Um, and then this, they also have a $370 million uh, pending deal with Cigna Sports United, which is a German bike and tennis equipment retailer. So they're close to closing that investment with them. That's obviously clearly an investment. So as with everything with Saudi Arabia, you, know, you, you can label it sports washing. It, it's probably, you know, it's, it can also be significantly other things that are uh, authentic and uh, can be defended uh, and, and make sense. And let me just close with one thing, uh, one more thing, in terms of trying to wrap all this in together. They just announced this week a $693 million strategy to support Saudi sports federations. And so this same Minister of Sport, Prince, Prince Abdulaziz bin Turkey al-Faisal, uh, they're going to they're, they're gonna plow money into growing a variety of sports and participation in this wide variety of sports. And, the, you know, these federations, now they've taken it from, uh, let, me, let me quote them one more time. The government understands that, that Sport has a very important role to play for the future of the youth. Seventy percent of the population is below the age of 40, so we need to get them active. We need to get them more engaged in sports and make sure that we do it the right way. In 2017, we had 32 sporting federations. Today, we have 92 federations. Uh, that shows you what a big investment is happening within the kingdom. So I'm with you. I think the sports washing accusation is probably too simplistic, and especially with a country like Saudi Arabia, which is trying to progress in a bunch of different areas. And I also think it's interesting. There's a there's a corollary here with the the, the uh, public investment fund in general, because the Saudi public investment fund has multiple mandates: two, go out and into the world and find good investment opportunities. I mean, one, go out in the world, find good investment opportunities wherever they are, whatever sector they are. Ideally, you know, 
secure or get a piece of technologies that will come back and help Saudi Arabia and their Vision 2030. Two, the second part is inward investment of $40 billion a year is what the goal is. Same thing here. So let's call it sports washing. But in each of these investments, you can see a, a, a real tie back back into Saudi Arabia. You know, so if you're spending $410 million, you know, you can call a sport on, in Newcastle United, which is the most prominent one and what everyone's in an uproar about. Um, okay, this sports washing, but it also might be an investment. And it also ties in with a, 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 a trying to build a whole soccer and youth participation ecosystem back in Saudi Arabia. So again, it's just, it's just not that simple for Saudi Arabia. I think that was a, I think that was a pro, the, the best explanation of why sports washing is at most just one thing of many things that it, like, for example, just going back to the Newcastle thing, you know, I'm pretending that I'm Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman right now, and I'm, I'm chairman <laughs> of the, the PIF, the PIF. Um, I'd like one of the new lucids. <laughs> We're going to have lucid, you get a lucid air and you get a lucid air. Um, but you know, I, I'm, I'm buying Newcastle United knowing that during the process of me buying it and for years after that, the British press, which is notoriously the hardest and most, most ruthless is going to absolutely, uh, dig right into everything about me. Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, the PIF, the Saudi government, the history of human rights in Saudi Arabia. And that's mm -hmm. just the press. I mean, then after I have successfully bought the team, um, almost every time that the name came, comes up, um, you know, they're going to mention me, they're going to mention all the bad things that I've done. And if you're, uh, you know, a publication or you're a fan of another team, you're not going to care about holding back or saying something polite about Saudi Arabia, you're going to use this as a chance to, you know, rail into the kingdom and, you know, make all of Newcastle United seem like it's, they're all Saudis, like it's a Saudi based team. And it's just right. like, I don't, that, that's why I've been sort of, you know, sarcastic about this in, in, in saying that I don't really understand it. It's just, I don't see a point in, into why anyone would do this. And then that's just, that's one issue. The other issue is that genuinely Saudi Arabia had zero sports in, 10 years ago. I mean, basically zero. And like you said, the youth population, people weren't going out and playing basketball or soccer or anything. You know, they were, they were sort of just like, it was just nothing. So they're trying to develop an industry from nothing. And a way to do it is to do things like this, you know, to bring in sports so people can see it and then children get excited about it and say, whoa, I want to be a, you know, I want to be a soccer player. I mean, this is great. I want to, you know, I, maybe I want to get into, you know, prize fighting. Or I want to get into, um, you know, MMA and stuff like that because we, we've seen one of those events come. I mean, that's how kids in the U.S. get into sports. Their parents take them to a baseball game and they say, I want to be a baseball player. I want to play baseball now. Get me onto a youth team. And so I just, I think it's really, um, I just, I don't want to say any argument is lazy because people don't intend to be lazy with arguments, but I think it's a really lazy argument to say, oh, it's just sports washing as if, you know, Saudi Arabia is hoping that by buying Newcastle United, people won't mention Jamal Khashoggi or something like that. It's like, well, I, in fact, the opposite is happening. I mean, I get it if it's like, you know, uh, Enron in the height of the scandal bought the Texas Rangers, you'd be like, well, I think they're trying to cover something up here, but it's like, like you, like you just highlighted brilliantly. It's that's, that's not what's happening here. And this is really about investment. I mean, like you said, I mean, if, if they bought Newcastle United for how much 400 million, who knows what it's going to be worth in five years, it could be worth a billion dollars. I mean, that's a, you know, it's it, an investment, it, it's an investment, you know? So, uh, I just, uh, we see this, Richard, we see this word basically every day in doing our newsletter. And um, it's never made a ton of sense to me, but it's good to sort of see it in the light of, hey, well, you know, maybe, but they're also, these are investments and they're, you know, improving the quality of life for Saudis. That's a huge thing for them. They don't care about criticism if that's the end result. Yeah. And, and I would just add, you know, it's not only sports washing, but uh, again, you know, the Saudis are going to get, the Saudis get pinged every day, all day. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, as you point out, I, I don't think, they didn't walk into Newcastle unaware of what the fallout would be. 
I think they walked into Newcastle and, and, and recognized there'd be fallout and said, well, we can certainly live with that. There's other goals we want to get. But the other thing, the thing that frustrates me is that, and frustrate me, it's, it's just uh, an observation, is that so many people, uh, you know, you criticize Saudi Arabia for Formula One, your sports washing. Well, the Formula One, as, 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 as noted, resulted in an opening up of the country in terms of access. You criticize Saudi Arabia for, for uh, you know, golf tournaments or anything, but these are all bringing people into the country. They're opening it up. They're encouraging it on its path to be more accessible. And and traditionally, when you start on that trajectory, human rights often come along. And I'm not saying that's I'm not saying it resolves the human rights issue in Saudi Arabia. That's really a deeper question in terms of, of politics and how they want to manage change. Um, but uh, there's just a lot of good going on in terms of sports in Saudi Arabia. And the, 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 the primary good is the participation rates, the health factor that's being achieved. Um, and of course, the, you know, the uh, opportunities given to women that didn't exist before, you know, the, so, so I agree with you. S sports washing is, um, it, is, it can be more rigorous and it's too simplistic very often. Sometimes it's spot on. And sports are the ultimate distraction. I think that when you say things like sports washing, you're, you're bringing in, you know, you're sort of like, for example, if you're a journalist being like, this is sports washing, you're sort of bringing that into the conversation when many sports fans are like, man, I, I work really hard. I got one game a week. I really don't want to hear any of this. I want to see how well they do. I really you know, wish my team was good. I wish my team were better. Like, you know, I wish the Saudis would buy the Washington yeah. football team. <laughs> Man, that would be awesome. <laughs> we, you've got two supporters in that happening right exactly. here. So if that goes down. And, well, and, and, you know, we don't want to be flip. We can't be flip about no. human rights and that sort of thing. I just think there's, uh, you know, you also can't at the same time distill uh a country and its 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 long-term economic social goals down into you know one word. Mm -hmm. Next week we'll have an awesome interview with uh, Fahad Nazar, spokesman of the Saudi Embassy in Washington. A really good conversation with him. Uh, check that out. Um, again, thank you for everybody who's subscribed to this podcast or leaving us uh, feedback online, especially those that leave reviews wherever you get your podcast. That helps us a lot. Richard, thank you very much. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Lucian. Happy Thanksgiving to you and the fam. Thank you. I'll look a lot bigger on the screen next week, but uh, <laughs> we'll just have to get by that. <laughs>